morning. By the way, it is happy birthday day, by the way, for those of you that didn't think to wear red like me. Well, actually, I didn't have any red that I could put on. So, <laughs> some of you are wearing red, some of you are wearing orange. It is Pentecost, so happy birthday. <laughs> O oh God, open my lips, and then my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. And as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. God, you have done men so many things. You have made them all so wisely. The earth is full of your creations. And men are succeeding, wise and deep, with the countless creatures, living things, both small and large. There go the ships on it, Leviathan, which you made, slaves in it. All your creation waits for you to give them their food on time time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled completely. No, but when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to death. When you let loose your breath, they are created. And when you make the surface of the ground brand new again, let God's glory last forever. Let God rejoice in all God has made. God is only to look at the earth and it shakes. God just touches the mountain and they erupt in smoke. I will sing to God as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I'm still alive. Let my praise be pleasing to God. I I'm rejoicing in God. Let my whole being bless God. Praise God. Amen. Let us sing together, come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove. We'll do all three verses for this one. Birthday ritual. Cake. Cake? Cake and ice cream. Cake and ice cream. And phone calls. And phone calls. Cards. Cards. In my family, when we were growing up, the week before our birthday, Dad would take us out to lunch by ourselves. And since Dad was so often so busy, that was a special treat for us. So we would get to pick where we would go to lunch with just dad and us. And so that was kind of special for us growing up. So we always looked forward to that. That was part of our birthday presents. We didn't get a lot of presents. It was usually just one present from mom and dad and then a present from each of our siblings, um, which was always interesting because they didn't, the parents would take the siblings shopping separately. So one year I ended up with the same Barbie from both of my siblings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we ended up taking back one, and I think I ended up with the, I think it was PJ or whatever the other Barbie 
friend doll was at the time. I don't remember the name of it at this point, but yeah, you get the idea. We ended up with two Barbie dolls that way, but you get the idea. Um, but that was the special thing for my family was to go out to lunch with dad and we got to go to a grown up restaurant. You didn't go to McDonald's, you didn't go to Pizza Hut, you didn't go to Burger King, you didn't go to one of the other chain restaurants, you got to go to a grown up restaurant. So it was in Indiana, Pennsylvania, it was the, the restaurant that's called The Classroom. And it was the um, Jimmy Stewart's famous restaurant. So every once in a while when I was growing up, Jimmy Stewart was still alive and you would go in and you would get to see Jimmy Stewart in the restaurant. This was Jimmy Stewart's hometown after all. So you would occasionally see Jimmy Stewart and his wife sitting in the restaurant in the booth. Um, and in town, we knew not to say hello, but when there were tourists or somebody in town, they would be all flocking to the table and um, all, the, all the locals would be kind of trying to block off the table so that they could have a regular lunch. It was kind of a diner, kind of like pool water, but um, they made a special sandwich for him, and so everybody in town would get that sandwich. It was... <laughs> so that was where we would go there. And then when we moved to um, Findlay, Ohio, we would get a different thing. We would go out to one of the Chinese restaurants, and we would get um, meal there. But it was, it was fun because we got to go when it was just us and Dad. That was kind of what we did. But when you look at the birthday of the church... This is the day we call the birthday of the church. This is Pentecost. This is the day we celebrate the day that the church comes into being. And it comes into being in a kind of a special way. We have all of the people gathered in that upper room. And it's men and women, children, and suddenly something happens. Anybody remember what happens in the story? They talk in tongues. And I will be very nice to you in the story today. I left out all the names of the languages. <laughs> um, I was very nice. It didn't make you have to list that whole name, list of things when you read that. Whoever reads scripture today, I skipped that section of verses. Um, so you don't have to mess with all those nasty names, whoever's getting to read scripture today for you. So um, you'll be happy to know that I was nice. Um, but you've got people from all over the world um, and if you look at a map of Europe um, and you get out that ancient map and you lay it over the map, it um, stretches from East India. It, some of the places on that map go up to about the Ganges River. And, some of, and then when you look to the west, you have India. You have, you have India to Spain. Um, no, it doesn't say Spain, it says Rome, but when you talk to people, if you look at the people who are experts in the scripture, when it says Rome, what they really mean is any place that spoke Latin. Um, and that includes Spain and Portugal, so you're up to the Atlantic, and north to Britain. And then when you talk about Egypt, that means any place where the Nile River goes. So you're down into Chad and Sudan and northern Kenya. And when you talk about Libya, you're talking about not just what we call Libya, but Tunisia and Algeria and Morocco. If you look at a map that was put to, would be put together by an ancient Roman, everything else on the map would essentially say, here be dragons. They had nothing else on their maps. There was nothing south of that and nothing outside of basically a vague, oh, there's a bunch of people that are trying to invade us here and there might be something south of that, but we have no idea what it is. There was certainly nothing west of the Atlantic. As far as they knew, that was the whole world with one exception. They only knew of anything to the east of that. But there was a great big huge desert in the way. They knew China was out there, but it was really hard to get to. That was the whole world as far as they were concerned. And so when they were talking about the church going to the whole world, as far as they knew on that day, the church really did go to the whole world. 
It'll take 2,000 years for it to actually make it that far. But the Bible really does give its fulfillment on that day. The church is born, and in that space of 50 days, there are people in every one of the major language groups that they know about who have heard the gospel. So about how many do you think different languages were they speaking that day that, I mean, these different people could understand? Um, probably 15 or so. Um, there were, of course, more languages than that, but there were really, like, four languages that if you understood those four languages, you could get just about anywhere in the world, as far as they knew, with the exception of Chinese. Um, with the with those languages, if you, if you knew Latin, Greek, and then um, East Aramaic, which is the language of um, what would now be Mesopotamia, what would be now Iran and Iraq, um, you could communicate with just about anybody in the Mediterranean basin, and then if you knew what would become Celtic languages, um, it has a longer name than that, but let's call it Celtic because we can actually say Gaelic or Celtic. <laughs> the other one is, it's got like three consonants in the beginning, and I'm not going to say it, it'll spit on poor Pat. <laughs> um, and then in the south on, um, the southern side, there's um, it's now on Herrick. Um, we would probably think of it more um, as Amazog or Berber um, would be the other language. Well, I can't remember whether it was Wednesday or Friday, but if you haven't read uh, Father Bain's article in the newspaper last week about Pentecost, you mm -hmm. should. Yeah, he talks the, about the same thing. The history, yeah. yeah. I can't read that. Yeah, but it's it, there's basically four or five languages that if you had the had basically Latin and Greek, and then um, East Aramaic, you could pretty much any place in that area be understood. It might not be the person's first language, but they probably understood enough to get around. Jesus was probably at least trilingual, if not quadlingual. He knew Greek and he knew Hebrew and he knew Aramaic. He probably had a little bit of Latin, too. And we know that just simply because of where he probably did most of his construction work. Um, Sepphoris, which is the main town that was being built near Nazareth, most of the language in the air, most of the language artifacts that we find in that area are Greek. So um, not. Aramaic, and Aramaic would have been the language he spoke at home, and he obviously knew Hebrew because he was asked to read Hebrew in the synagogue. So we know that he knew at least Aramaic and Hebrew, and then if he was working construction sites, he had to at least understand enough to be told, hammer that nail there. <laughs> so if you think about that, we tend to think of the people in the Holy Land as being these peasants who didn't understand, but most of the most of the disciples probably understood at least Greek and Aramaic, and a fair number of them were probably also fluent in Hebrew. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day in which we remember. The birth, of your church, the birth of your church, and the speed in which it spread. Give our feet wings to spread your good news to those around us. Amen. Jesus promises us a comforter but we do not always seek peace or comfort in healthy ways. Let us consider how we have not sought peace for ourselves, our nation, for our community, for the community of nations, and for all of creation. Then let us pray.
Hear our prayer, O God. Loving God, divine comforter, peace is absence from our hearts, from pain to grief, and from toil to frustrations. We yearn for what we lack. We ache for the pains and injustices of this world to cease. What we call is pause and voice turns to you. How can we better integrate your presence in our lives when we have forgotten to include your joys and heartaches? Move us to seek you and speak the burdens of our hearts to you. May your spirit refill our souls with peace. Amen. The Spirit of God delivers grace and peace as we move through our journeys and inspires us to connect with God and neighbor, to create the world of hope and joy. Amen. Heirs and fellow heirs. 
co-heirs with Christ, if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. Let's sing verses 1, 3, and 5. today comes from the book of Joel, the second chapter, beginning in the 23rd verse. You'll find that on page 1071. Hear the word of God. Children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God, because he will give you the early rain as a sign of righteousness. He will pour down abundant rain for you, the early and the late rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and fresh oil. I will repay you for the years that the, lo that the cutting locust, the swarming locust, the hopping locust, and the de devouring locust have eaten. My great army, which I sent against you, you will eat abundantly and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has done wonders for you and my people will never again be put to shame. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God. No other exists. Never again will my people be put to shame. After that, I will pour out my Spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit upon male and female slaves. I will give signs in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. But everyone who calls on the Lord's name will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be security, as the Lord has promised. And in Jerusalem the Lord will summon those who survive. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of this God's holy word. Amen. All right. Have you ever tried to light a fire by one of our ancestors' methods? You know, the little the little bow with the oh, stick. Oh, no, no, no. 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 Uh, the magnifying glass might work. I've not tried that one recently, but I've tried the bow and stick thing. Don't do it. Doesn't work. I've never had much luck with it. I apparently am doing it wrong. Apparently, I've been spreading the little stuff at the bottom too widely, and that's what the problem is. Um, 
And this is one of the problems with human history, right? Um, kindling is just scattered too widely and so the spark never catches. We teach things, but we don't teach them right. We don't keep the practice up. We're often thwarted by our own best intentions. We remember that there's things that we learned in the past, but we don't remember how we did them. Um, and so we can't pass them down correctly. People are divided about how to do them, whether or not we should be using the magnifying glass or the mirror or the the bow and air, the bow and stick thing or flint and steel. I think I'll stick with the matches. We get divided, and we can't make up our minds. Divisions come in many kinds, and yet at the core, we're all the same. Um, and this has puzzled people for many generations. Why do we make these divisions? Why do we not agree on how we should start a fire? I still think we'll stick with matches, right? Um, or are you one of those people that decides you're going to put the lighter fluid all over the charcoal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or gasoline, right? <laughs> Why do we make those judgments? Psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists, everyone argues about what has caused these divisions. Are they caused by warrior mentalities, overpopulation, an overabundance of young people, groupthink, poor management of fear, or are there at least a dozen different theories, and sometimes that's just one person. The prophet Joel tells us this is nothing new. Unlike most of the rest of the prophets, we're not really sure when the book of Joel is written. Um, it doesn't give us any real context. Um, it could be written as early as the 7th century BCE, or which is just after the northern ten tribes are carried off into exile, or as early or as late as the 4th, just before the exile of the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, we're not quite sure. We know it's someplace in between that, but that's three centuries. It could be any of a number of kings, in other words. All we know for sure is that there aren't two Jewish kingdoms existing in the land, and it's sometime after David and Solomon. So we know it's not during the United Kingdom, and we know it's after the Northern Kingdom has been carried off into exile. Big time of span, big span time there. Um, we know that there are foreign raiders coming in from the desert, and there are bugs. A lot of books. Um, this passage at least tells us there are four different kinds, or maybe three different kinds, depending on which version of the Hebrew text you're reading, um, of locusts. The version we have today has cutting locusts, swarming locusts, hopping locusts, and devouring locusts. And we think those are all different kinds of locusts. Um, all I can think of is those miserable years back east when we would have the three, five, and seven year cicadas all up at one time. Um, all I can say is crunch and squish and yuck. <laughs> um, if you were lucky, you got the blueberries and the strawberries in before um, the locusts came up. The corn crop was basically a non-starter and the soybeans were a mess. That was pretty much what the year's cash crops looked like. Um, you didn't get much out of the garden, and pretty much, like I said, it was squish and crunch and yick. That was pretty much what the ground looked like all summer. The grass was a mess, um, nobody wanted to be outside, you forgot planting flowers, and if you were really unlucky, it was also a year for gypsy moths. It was a miserable summer the whole way around, and we didn't have air conditioning, so you had to keep the windows shut because you didn't want the stupid things inside. Um, and there were bugs everywhere. This is what these people were dealing with. Now, of course, they didn't even have um, herbicides and pesticides to get rid of most of these bugs, so they were really stuck. Um, pumpkins might have survived back east. I don't think they had pumpkins. Um, apparently, this is what the Jurassic Park movie is going to start with. So, thick locusts in that. According to Joel, all the politicians were corrupt. So, if you were counting on farm subsidies, they weren't happening either. Um, so, nothing under, new is under the, under the sun, right? 
Joel isn't quite all doom and gloom, though that is pretty much, if you were trying to title the um, book, doom and gloom is a good name for him or for Amos. You can pick which one you want to give that title to. Um, it certainly sounds like it from this passage. You've got locusts, lots of them, and then you've got the dying sun and the blood on the moon. Nice, right? However, in between the locusts and the blood on the moon, um, you've got this passage. You will eat abundantly and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has done wonders for you, and my people will never again be put to shame. That sounds good. I like that part of the passage. You will know that I am in the midst of, the, of Israel, and I am the Lord your God. No other God exists. Never again will my people be put to shame. And here's the part of the passage that Peter quotes. After that, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young people will see vision. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on your female and your male slaves. Peter uses that prophecy to explain what is happening on the day of Pentecost. It hints at a world where the old bonds are changed, where the old orders are rewritten, where once only male heads of households have counted, everyone is suddenly part of the story. Everyone has a message and is given a chance to speak. Where once there was a sharp divide between slave and free, even that divide is now torn asunder. When we think of prophetic words, we usually think of the doom and gloom that start and end the passage, you know, all those locusts and all the blood on the moon. Um, but that is seldom what the Bible is talking about. It usually talks about what is happening right now. It is not so much foretelling as forthtelling. It is about what is going on in the world at the moment the prophet is writing. Joel promises that all people will carry the promise. And he's not talking about some future day, but in the moment in which he is writing. He's talking about when people feel like there is no hope left, it's time to start looking at all the people and not just some of the people. God's message is not meant to be locked away, he says. Access to the truth should be available for everyone. In this light, Pentecost, in Peter's view, becomes a potent symbol of God's power to reverse our worst desires and the inherent lines that divide us from one another. The Spirit comes among us and among the disciples and gives them the ability to speak in all the major languages of the known world at the time. In an effort to be nice to the reader, I left out that whole list of where the people were at. But let's go ahead and listen to it. I'll read it for you. Assuming I can get the page to turn so I can actually read it. They were from Parthia and Media and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya near Cyrene. Some of us were from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism. And some of us were from Crete and Arabia. And like I said earlier, if you were to lay this out on the map, here are the countries that you would have to put this on. For Parthia, Media, and Elam, we would have to list parts of the following countries. Russia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Afghanistan. Mesopotamia is made up of two modern, mostly of two modern countries, Iran and Iraq but it included the nearer parts of Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. Cappadocia and Pontus encompassed parts, parts of Turkey, Turkey, Armenia, Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia, Serbia, Georgia, and up into the much disputed territory in the news at present, Crimea. Asia includes Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. Arabia included all of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Qatar, and the UAE. Egypt stretched down into the modern parts of Sudan, South Sudan, Chad, and Kenya, as well as um, parts of modern Ethiopia and Eritrea. 
Libya included not only the country of that name that we name today, but Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and northern Nigeria. And even Rome and Crete cover more than what we name by those today. For Crete, think of it as a catch-all of all the islands in the Mediterranean. So that would include Cyprus, Malta, and all the Greek islands. Rome was often used to refer to all the Roman Latin-speaking ter territory of Europe, so it may well have referenced all of Italy, Spain, and Portugal, plus parts of modern France, Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, and southwest England and Wales. And as I said earlier, the rest of Africa and Europe essentially said, here be dragons. Of all the places that existed on the ancient Roman imperial map, of the world. The only one not included in this list was Imperial China. And you had to go through an area that also said, here be dragons, to get there. Every other nation, every other regional body, every other language group, and every other direction on the map is covered. If you've thrown a party and invited 50 people, figuring 30 people would show up, this is not it. This is what happens when you throw a party for 40 people and 90 people show up. And they were astounded. Peter's speech later will tie this to the day of the Lord. This day, this is the day all of them are expecting. This was the day foretold when all the divided and dispersed people of the world of Israel would come back together from the four corners of the earth. It prom the promises also included a promise that to the Gentile nations who would come to Zion. The languages that had divided the world are torn down in one incredible moment. The power of the Spirit continues to break down barriers dividing humans. Our need for power is released and tamed into something much more manageable. We are able to recognize the full humanity of others and to serve it with gladness. Our need for knowledge meets the wisdom of God. In Jesus Christ, we have our needs brought under control. It becomes a willingness to surrender not only our own desires, but our own need for power to those of God. Pentecost becomes the gathering point, not just for those people 2,000 years ago, but our own gathering point. The church comes into being. People are called out of their own lives and ways of being. Where once we were scattered and divided, God gathers us into a single community. Though we continue to speak a multitude of languages, we are united by our faith and belief in God. We are transformed into a body of God's people called to serve. We are transformed into a body of people who are one in faith. We have been gathered together from the scattered ends of the world. We come alive on Pentecost. We hope for a new world and are set on fire by our faith in a God who called each of us by name. Consider these words from the poet William Blake about this day. Until the eye catch fire, God will not be seen. Unless the ear catch fire, God will not be heard. Unless the tongue catch fire, God will not be named. Unless the heart catch fire, God will not be loved. Unless the mind catch fire, God will not be known. When God draws near in the person of Jesus, we are drawn inevitably to this story. We participate in it because we have found something indescribably beautiful and real. Our voices break with wonder and laugh with joy. Hope springs new and real, and feet that were bo broken dance with the abundance that we have been gifted. Pentecost pours out that gift to all nations, all peoples, all languages, and all tongues. The Spirit of God is upon us all. Amen.
because of our love for the divine giver, we always seek ways to share our love through our treasures, talents, and time. Whether we live in this spirit or this hour, this through this week, we remember that God's spirit encircles these gifts with hope. As we take a moment to reflect on our gifts, we will actually bring those forward when we come to get our communion. So we'll just move at this point to the doxology.
go through her graduation. I had a door. Good. Oh, yay. Great graduation from high school on Friday at the uh, Dale Boston. And she's been accepted into George Washington University in Washington, D.C. All right. Okay. Oh, and we have all of the plots built out here this year for yes. um, three different people using one or two plots. So, Chuck yeah. called me and told me that the water is ready to be turned on. Mm -hmm. and colored staff there. He just wants us to watch <clears throat> to make sure nobody leaves the water running. Mm -hmm. I've been telling them right now because it's been so cold at night to unfasten the hose rather than leaving it attached. So, that was one of the ways to make sure it wasn't staying. Well, we've had little munchkins in the past. Karen would just come turn the faucet on and run away and take it to the seat. Yep. So All of our people this year are over the age of 50, so we shouldn't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so we should be okay this time. So. No matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Come to the table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not because you are filled, but because in your emptiness you stand in need of God's mercy and assurance. Come not to express opinion, but to seek the presence and the very first spirit. Come to this table then, sisters and brothers, just as you are. This is the joyful feast of the children of God. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. With the majesty of your eternal hand, you shape this world and all that is in it. By your Holy Spirit, you breathe life into human form and set us on earth to praise and serve you. When we wandered from your ways and were lost in sin's wilderness, you, your truth burned in the hearts of prophets who called your people to return to the path of righteousness. In the fullness of time, you sent your child to be our deliverer. In every age, your Holy Spirit has led us in your ways. Therefore, with the faithful in every time and place, we praise your holy name. Holy, holy, holy God, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God of God. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. At Christ's baptism by John, your spirit came with gentle wings, settling on him with your blessing. In the wilderness of temptation, your spirit stood by with power. In Christ's life and ministry, your spirit led Jesus to serve the poor, proclaim freedom from sin's bondage, open the eyes of faith's sight, and befriend the friendless and the outcast. In all Christ did, said and did, Jesus announced the coming of your saving might. By Christ's death on the cross and rising from the tomb, Jesus broke the power of death and led the way to eternal life. Ascended to rule on high, Christ prays for us and promises the coming of peace and power. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and passed it among the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and passed it among his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the sins of many. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, therefore we take this bread and this cup from the gift you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. 
Accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for the living and holy offering of ourselves, and that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out our, your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of body and blood of Christ. By your Holy Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in Christ's name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Hear us, O God, as we give thanks for those who have received good news this day. We thank you for the coming of the summer warmth, for Clayton's recovery, for Gracie's graduation and Maisie's return to school so she might celebrate with her friends. We pray for those who are continuing to struggle. We ask that you will be with all the doctors and nurses and other care workers at the clinic, especially be with Elise as she struggles this week. We pray for Larry, that he might continue to recover. Oh God, it has been a hard couple of weeks for our nation as we struggle with the gun violence in schools and shopping centers and hospitals and in places we have not even heard of. Seems every day there is a new place and new death. We don't know what to do. Give us wisdom, give our leaders insight. We pray for those at war and ask for peace. We pray for those who mourn, especially the families of Jim Duran and Deacon. Give them peace where they have not seen. And now by the fire of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, forge us into one church, many and different people, together in Christ's embrace. Set our hearts aflame with a love for truth and the desire to do your will, and that your witness our witness to Christ may burn brightly in the lives of discipleship. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ all glory and honor are yours, almighty creator, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Through the bread broken, we participate in the body of Christ. And through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life that Christ has given. Come, for all things are now ready. Body of Christ, both broken for you, and the cup of salvation poured out for many. Take and eat and drink.
Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I should have it. I don't know what happened to it. 